volume down on one screen so it wouldn't have the, the feedback. Hey everyone, are we, <laughs> we are live on Facebook and we're live on Instagram on it's Kimberly Renee's page. It's a little weird because I have an echo in my ears from her side, but that's okay. <laughs> we are go so welcome. Let's start there. So and it, like on the Instagram, you can see like half my face. All right, <laughs> hey, this should be interesting. So we're trying. We're making it work. I'll make it work. So today we are live. It's our Thursday. It's our 4 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, usual time. And we thank you for supporting the Plant Based Network, Virtual Veg Fest, Triangle Veg Fest, and Veg Fest Expos. And we would like, of course, to thank Superior Electrolytes for sponsoring our lives this week and also went out to all our newsletters. If you want to join our newsletter, you can go to any of our websites and sign up. And of course, if you can go to Virtual Veg Fest and shop, we and all the vendors would really appreciate it. And of course, going to YouTube and subscribing to our Virtual Veg Fest page. The dogs are starting up early, which is awesome. Let's see. So I met Kimberly Barnes in Atlanta. And the reason I met her was because I was emceeing the second room or third room last, last year for the Atlanta Veg Fest. And I don't normally stay in the room, but I do come back for Q&A and uh, listen somewhat. And I was super impressed by Kimberly because there were some things that she said that had me go and say to the audience, are you squirming in your seats? Because I can understand why you would be because you said things that were incredibly important to be said and that we can definitely unpack today because I want everyone else to hear it, which is one of the reasons why I invited you to come and speak at, I think four veg fest this year that we don't know are happening. <laughs> we don't know if they're happening yet. So, cause that, uh, well, they're all moved to the fall <laughs> and they, you know, we'll see, but it, I mean, you're absolutely an incredible person and, you. and it was very easy to see that, you know, you had important things to say. You not only like are an influential speaker, but you also cook. You like do cooking classes, chef. You do them live, and then you started like vegan love, right? Food love, yes. Food love, right? Vegan food love, food love, which is helping people who need food right now during what's going on. And of course, we it would be remiss of us not to talk about current events during this talk yes. as well. So yes. I'm going to throw it at Kimberly so she can share more about who she is. And then, of course, our usual free flowing. This is very laid back. Uh, we're just going to have a come. If you want to talk with us, please, in the comments, let me not forget that. Please say that you're here. Say hello. Say where you're from. Ask comments. Ask questions. I mean, if you have any comments, please share. We would love to hear from you because it always helps with the with the talk if it's not just me figuring out what to ask. <laughs> so Kimberly, let's do it. Yeah, so thank you so much for um, Feline. It says, uh, there's one question that says, can we also hear her talk about what she does instead of you explaining <laughs> Oh my gosh, vegan Andrea, fine, fine. I'll tell you what I do. <laughs> so, um, so I do a lot of different things. My heart is to, feed people. That's where my heart is. I've been um, focused on food insecurity since I was probably 11 years old, 11 or 12. I've been in soup kitchens and I even made it a part of my Thanksgiving tradition to uh, prepare meals for other people before I would go and eat for myself. So I would get up at like 3 a.m., to go into the kitchen, you know, at the soup kitchens. This was before I was vegan. So I was turn, tearing apart turkeys and all that kind of stuff back then um, and, and helping people. So that's just been a major part or major thread in my life. And now I, I found a way to do the same thing technically without leaving the house. And I felt like that was important because of what's going on with coronavirus, et cetera. And I think, and I wanted to be able to help, but I also wanted to be protected. I wanted to be safe. And so it was like, how do we how do we balance that? And so out of that birth, food love, because I also saw that that black and Latinx communities were experiencing um, the highest rate of death as it relates to COVID-19. 
Um, and part of that is because of just history of systemic racism. I won't dig into that. I do have an article that I've written if you wanna go to my site and read that where it talks about why these issues and why more black people have um, hypertension, diabetes, asthma, et cetera. It's a long story. I won't spend a bunch of time talking about that right now, but ultimately I wanted to make sure that I was intentional about connecting with people of color in addition to people who were hungry in general. So, because what happens a lot of times when we, when we take on these efforts to support our community, we end up helping people who are close to us. You know, we help our neighbor, we help the person across the street, we help the people in our zip code, and that's important. What happens also sometimes is you have, why is it like I'm sweating? Y'all see this glisten right here? <laughs> Sorry, I got distracted. <laughs> so, so it's important that we don't just stick in our communities, that we that we expand, that we make sure that the resources are, are, are spread as much as possible. So um, that's essentially food love and might be vegan. Uh, I focus primarily on, you know, talking, encouraging people uh, in ways of, how intersectionality and veganism kind of intersect. And that's actually the talk that I gave at Atlanta Veg Fest last year. It's about, uh, uh, what, did I, what was it called? What did I call it? I said in the intersectionality and veganism, uh, galvanizing, building bridges and galvanizing communities. That was the name of the, that was the name of the talk. So in that talk, um, I shared a lot of personal experiences because I think sharing personal experiences gives people a face to what racism can look like because a lot of times we'll assume which we've seen if you've been posting about things recently you you have seen reactions from the things that you might post where people are assuming that they're not racist because we say that racism or we feel that racism you have to be evil to be racist that's not necessarily the case you can be nice you can be racist you can be inclusive you can have a black boyfriend you can have black friends you can listen to r&b and still be racist because ultimately racism is uh rooted in a system and the fruit of it comes out in different biases and those biases are what we try to break down because those biases that implicit bias is what makes it difficult for other people to to further themselves uh, to have access to the same resources, to um, not have to deal with uh, the fact that they don't have access to fresh food. Um, there's just so many things that just compound on top of that. And so long story short, um, so somebody asked, do I have the talk somewhere where I can listen? No, I, I didn't record that talk. Um, it was really good because it was, I mean, the, pop, the talk was, um, it, the talk was good. Like, I mean, I gave it, right? I wrote it, <laughs> but um but it was it was very impactful and so hopefully i'll be able to bring up today some of the things that were that were in that talk oh you definitely can i i, I require you i expect require. you to bring up some of the stuff that was in that talk so, <laughs> because... so okay well, well i mean which what's one one story that you feel like um i shared that you would want me to repeat from my own life because i mean there's just so much i mean you know, I mean, I wake up and I'm black. I can't take it off. So, I'm, right. <laughs> so I mean, there's stories. There's there's lots of stories. So, so is there one that like stood out to you that you felt like I could share? Oh, most definitely. You were talking about now. I don't know the whole part of the story, right? Because the thing that resonated with me was you were discussing how you were on a bus, mm. and a, a police officer came onto the bus. Yes. And okay. How you felt at that yeah. moment because. I will not feel that way if a police officer yeah. comes to the house because in my mind, I think it's not coming from me. Yeah, right. Okay. Right? So, yeah. So I ended up on a bus from Richmond to DC and um, it was a Greyhound. I don't like Greyhound to be honest with you, but it was the last ticket I could get and I had to get on Greyhound. So I was like, okay, we're just gonna do this. So I got on the bus and I got my seat, everything is going pretty well. It seems we're about to, to leave, we're, um, we're just about on time to, to, to exit. And there's a gentleman who's making a ruckus in the front of the bus. Uh, he's supposed to have, either he's supposed to have a ticket, he doesn't have a ticket, he has the wrong ticket, something's going on and he's having an altercation with the bus driver. I mean, that's fine, like it's, it's whatever, it's two people, they'll deal with it and then we'll keep going. The next thing I know, um, is the police got called and 
immediately, like my heart started to just like pound. Like I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And so the first thing that I did was I picked up the phone and I called my best friend. I said, I need you to stay on the phone with me. I'm even tearing up now, I'm talking about it now. I was like, I need you to stay on the phone with me in case something happens. Because I didn't want, I didn't want, um, I didn't must want my story to disappear if something happened to me. So, so ultimately I have what I call um, police anxiety. It's not a thing, it's not, it's not a label. You know, it doesn't, you can't Google it, I don't think. Um, I apologize, I'm supposed to be well put together today, y'all, but I'm a little emotional. Um, but nevertheless, I, I wanted to be on, my, on the phone with my friend so, so we would know, somebody would know what happened. And so, um, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's what I have. I have, I have police anxiety and, and nothing has ever happened to anybody close to me. Um, not like in my family, but I see it, you know, I see it every day. Um, and it's frustrating because we continue to post the same images over and over of, of black death in the way that comes across like murder porn. And I know that everyone has good intention in telling the story. It's like, we need to know, we need to know. But it is traumatized and it is re-traumatizing and it is re-traumatizing to watch it, to watch somebody who looks like you, to watch somebody who has full lips like you, who has dark skin like you, to watch somebody who has a daughter that looks like your daughter, to see that over and over is traumatizing. And I know it's that because I have, I've been having offline conversations with friends and we are all carrying that stress in our bodies. Like I haven't slept well. And keep this in mind, like I'm not in Minneapolis. Like I'm not even close, you know what I mean? Like, but but it is it is me, it is my people, you know? Um, so all of that to say, um, please just be mindful as you're sharing, you know, as you're sharing the stories, please be mindful how that, impacts other people, you know, at this stage where we've all seen it at least once um, and recognize that the people that you go to work with every day are experiencing this same trauma. I had a conversation with a friend of mine and she said, you know, I'm not getting sleep. I don't have an appetite right now. I need tissue. I need a, I need a, an assi a production assistant to give me a tissue. We ain't got no tissue. <laughs> Hold on, y'all. Wait a minute. <laughs> okay, I had to be my own PA there. Um, okay, so we I've, I've had conversation with my friends, um, and you know we are we're carrying this this weight um, collectively in our bodies, and you know we're going to work every day and trying to keep our face together. But look, you brought it up with me, like, and first thing, and I'm in tears, right? But that's what we're holding. You know what I mean? So when you see a black person who is posting something and, and trying to be helpful, know that this is a moment. This is a moment that will go in the history books to say that this was a pivot. The same way that we read about Martin Luther King, you will read about George Floyd 20 years from now, or maybe not read, we may have it all like digitally, I don't know, but wherever you find it, your children will be seeing this moment and saying, this was a pivot. And the question that you wanna answer is, where did you stand in this pivot? Because I'm, I'm, now think about this, when you go back to in history and you read those books and you say, well, I wasn't a slave owner, and you go back and you say, well, my parents weren't, like that's what you, a lot of times we stand on, well, my parents didn't own slaves. Okay, well, history, let's back up some. Back then, they did. There were people who owned slaves, there were people who didn't, right? And there were two different sides and we're at the same place. And no, nobody's enslaved at this moment, but you're gonna have to pick a side because that's all we see when you go back in history is pick a side. And which side do you pick? 
and and this picking the side doesn't land on I'm just gonna repost something, you know. Imagine being enslaved back then, and and all you did was give an enslaved person a hug. Now that's a beautiful moment, but they're still enslaved, boo. They still in chains. You know what I'm saying? Like, did you go and have a conversation with somebody? Did you sit down at the dinner table and correct your grandfather? I mean, I have tough conversations with my mom. It's like every other day with something with her. I love her. She loved me, but we have conversations and we black. You know what I'm saying? But we still have to have conversations. So being able to have the 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 wherewithal to pick a side, stand on a side and say, until all, until black lives matter, all lives don't matter. And instead of saying, well, what about me? And what about my portion? I had somebody bring that up and I'm so tired of that conversation, y'all. I'm so tired. Go on your phone right now. Not right now, cause we live, but later. <laughs> and just Google woman or man, just Google it and look at the images. 9,000 of those images are gonna be white people. Google man, white people. So when we talk about, people get offended when we say the word black and we put black on something. Well, the only way I'm gonna find a picture of a black man is if I put black in the front of it. And the reason for that is that the default is white. I don't have to say, let's, find, let's talk about white vegan influencers because they're already white. Like that's the default. That's the begin. That's where it is because because the world that we live in is white centric. Even though the world collectively, like the globe, is not white centric, in that that it is only white people. The way we live here is that everything is centered on whiteness. So the reason we say Black Lives Matter, the we the reason we say here are here are thirty Black influencer vegans that you can follow is because baby we've been living in the white default, and we got to reset. And so that's why it's important to reset. And yeah, we do talk about Asian. Yeah, we do talk about indigenous. We talk about all the people, all the things. Right now, we're talking about black people. And it's okay to say the word black. That's actually one of the things that I started the conversation with in our chat. Actually, the talk, um, Helene, was I let people know, like, I'm going to say black and white in this conversation. I'm going to say it. And it's okay. Like, I'm not saying it to mean harm, I'm saying it so we can understand and we set the stage to say, I understand we're gonna talk about black things, we're gonna talk about white things. And it's okay to do that. Um, it doesn't make you racist for, for putting a label on something. Um, but yeah, so so yeah, so that is my so that is my dramatic rendition and heartfelt, hopefully you guys felt me because that was real. Like, <laughs> I tried not to cry, I tried. You didn't cry in Atlanta, but you know what? Last year in Atlanta, there wasn't so much going on like at the same time leading right. up to a talk about something that <clears throat> impacts you every yeah. single day of your life. Right. You know, this isn't like it just happened, like I just happened to have it because there was someone in front of the bus that was having this go on. This is any time. It doesn't have to be on a bus. It can right. be, you know, it can be in your house. Right. Right. So right. as we know what happened there. Yeah. In <clears throat> yeah, so I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry you cried, but no, 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 I, no, it's so I good. totally, like, I'm, not, I'm yeah. not ashamed of my tears at all. Like this is, I, I feel all my feelings. Um, but I just, I'm looking at my face right now, and I told you we don't have a production assistant. I'm so glad I didn't put on makeup though. <laughs> I'm so glad, like. <laughs> Because that would have been a mess. Okay, I'm sorry. When people come in later, they'd be like, why are there streaks down her face? <laughs> you can start a new movement. <laughs> no, but, okay, I mean, so, yeah. But yeah. you're right. It, the side of history, I've said that uh, multiple times in posts that I've put out there, <coughs> is that we will yeah. be, we meaning all my platforms, will be on the correct side of history. Yeah. And that is to support Black Lives Matter. That is, for sure. For sure. there's, uh, right now in, in, in my feelings, there is no other thing to do. It's something that we have to do because I, as vegans, we're just going on the vegan platform. Yeah. It's not just about animals. And I'll say it every time I do these because it comes up often. 
we're not just here to help the animals. We're here to help human beings, which are also animals, but we're here to help humans as well. And if there's an injustice, we certainly know about injustices as vegans. And we need to take all that energy that we put into the pig, the cow, the chicken, the duck, the cats, the dogs, the sheep, everything, <laughs> the lions, the turtles, the alligators, the snakes. I mean, it goes over and over. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a cause of support and money being asked for pretty much every animal <laughs> on the planet by vegans is to also help people too. Yeah, it's I've, I've said this before. <clears throat> I posted on my Facebook and the, the premise is, if you can clearly identify the difference in treatment <clears throat> between cats and cows and chickens and dogs, but you refuse to acknowledge the difference between whites and blacks, and then your response is, why are we segregating? Why are we labeling? Why are we why are we making such a big deal? Aren't we supposed to be all one? <clears throat> well, baby, if that's the case, then don't go to the um to the pig slaughter and 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 feed them water because they're all because all animals are the same. And and don't have a hoopla about the the cows and the fact that they're being raped for milk because we're all the same, right? Because they're all the same. We're all the same. And ultimately, hopefully, that point comes across as we're not all treated the same. And we acknowledge where there's difference and we support where there's difference. That's the that's the definition of equity. <clears throat> A lot of times people want to live in um, equality. Equality says everything's the same. Everybody's the same. Give everybody the same opportunity. But if you've had a start, a beginning that is um, a different par, if you will, than others, then you have to do the work of equity to bring things to equality. We can't just say all things are equal without doing the work to make sure that it happens. <clears throat> and that's why we spend so much time having vigils for cows and pigs and chickens because they're different they're treated differently. The same way that indigenous, black, Latinx, gays, uh, differently abled are treated differently. So that's why we that's why we do that. And if you are and if you are vegan and <clears throat> you cannot recognize that difference, then I'm going to challenge um, your value system um, and say that you may be experiencing um, white saviorism instead of living in the space of unconditional compassion. <laughs> As Evan said, hi, Evan, uh, that's powerful. It's no joke. And Gina, hello. Thank you for joining us again. I, <laughs> you said it, you know, and you're right. There's a lot of people there's, there's a lot of mental health issues within the vegan community in regards to what they're doing. One, it's a very difficult thing to go and do those, to go do those vigils to see animals that are going to their death about, you know, a half hour later. But there's also, there are people who are taking their inner demons and applying them to the movement and not necessarily helping the movement by doing that. I think I only see your hair in the Instagram though. Oops, there we go. <laughs> but yes, all, but yes, all true, all true. Thanks. Right. Yeah, no, that's uh, in incredibly powerful. And I just gonna say that you can just keep going, <laughs> you know? So, must be vegan, not must be vegan. I want to call you might be vegan. It might be vegan. I just, it must exist in my head all, all week, actually. Might be vegan. How did it start? Oh, I, um, it started off as an experiment. <laughs> I was okay. like, um, somebody had asked the question, how long have I been vegan? So I answered that question. So I'm going to say uh, a little over three years going into the fourth year. And there was a moment essentially when I went vegan where <clears throat> I was in the kitchen because I've always cooked. I told you, I told everybody at the beginning that food has always been, you know, my love, 
whether that's feeding people in my small group or, you know, feeding people who are um, food insecure. And so <clears throat> I was cooking. I had a chicken, a little ham, whatever. And I was seasoning it, making it real good. And then I looked at the body of the hen and I experienced the fact that it was he was, she was, whatever the pronoun you prefer to use, was alive at one point. <clears throat> and at that moment, I felt like I was a murderer, honestly. And I was like, I'm sorry. Like I literally apologized to the hen. And honestly, most black folk, when I tell them this story, they're like, girl, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I don't know, it just happened. Like I can't, I'm not gonna make up a story just so they make it sound good. like it actually happened to me. <laughs> So it was that moment where I was like, I think that something is happening in the air with me and something might need to shift. Um, and I had already been thinking about veganism in general and eating plant-based because I wanted to, I've always been mindful of, of health and what I'm putting in my body. It was just that I wasn't ready to give up cheese. If I can be honest, I just wanted to eat cheese because it was good. So um, I was like, well, let me try vegetarian. So I did that for a while. Um, and then I, I learned about milk and then it just made sense. It's like, wait, in order to have milk, you had to have been pregnant. If you were pregnant, you had to have had a baby. They probably killed that baby. We ate that baby. Wait, how's she still giving milk though? Like if she, and so it just made, and then I started to think and then it just like went to this thread. Um, so it, it just gave me thought. It wasn't enough thought to just make me go vegan, but it, it did, it did help because the things that sort of like made the made it stick was the impact on the environment. Because I'm like, wait a minute, veganism is not just a movement for animals. Like this is human rights too, because if we ain't got nowhere to live, I mean, that's, that's human rights to me. So I'm like, it's all fitting. We not eat meat no more. And I'm gonna tell everybody I know. So that's when my vegan started. I started as an experiment on my, um, Instagram and I invited people to follow my page if they wanted me to like cook things for them because I was really good at it. I've had my friends for a really long time tell me, you know, girl, when you go open your restaurant, I'm like, I don't know. Restaurants don't really make a lot of money. And you know, I like <laughs> to have money. I'm just being honest. So um, I didn't want to like go and like get this big loan to have a restaurant. Um, so I was just, it just wasn't something I was thinking about. I'm like, maybe I can do a food truck. I don't know. So I starting this, it, this being a, my be vegan essentially is a media and consultancy group. So out of that, um, I create content that people consume. I create content and partnerships with media, with brands. Um, I go into corporate spaces and educate. Um, and that's part of one of the initiatives that I'm doing right now. I am having many conversations with brands. Many of the brands, if you think of your favorite vegan brand, I'm probably having a conversation with their CEO right now um, to talk about what we can do collectively to push the mo this movement forward. And this movement isn't just about um, over-policing. We're talking about everything from over-policing to systemic racism, including bias that lives in every single one of us and challenging them to look at their business and look at the people within that business and then make a public commitment to what they are going to do going forward to one, hold themselves accountable. Um, and then two, let us know how they are allowing this moment to impact or yeah, allowing this moment to impact the way that they think and do business. <clears throat> How's the reception been? Oh my God, amazing, amazing, okay? And I'm, I'm gonna keep it real, because if you know me, you know I keep it real, because three weeks ago, they weren't talking to me at all, because I sent them same messages three weeks ago. Um, so I have this moment of conflict, honestly. I have this moment of conflict um, because I know that somebody paid for these conversations with their life. Yes. So I am doing my best to be a good steward over the openness without capitalizing on it 
in a way that is, um, and I'm not capitalizing on it. I'm just gonna in in the period there um, that I am make I am taking advantage of the moment in order to help um, and not use it as. Y'all know what I'm trying to say. Y'all know what I'm saying. I mean, I think you're making sure they're sincere <laughs> and they're not just yeah. they're not capitalizing on the moment so that they can keep their customers or gain more because suddenly they're writing a statement because I've gotten a lot of them in my inboxes over the last few days. Black Lives Matter. Here's where we support. We support our community. We we don't agree with blah blah blah. And we have most of the people I'm getting the emails from are legitimate. Like I have no doubts. Right. That that's that's how they feel. And that this didn't just start three days ago or two weeks ago, that this is just it just, yo, if you didn't know, <laughs> here's what our politics are. But I think you already knew this. We're just reinforcing that. As yeah. Of, you know, but, I mean, it's beautiful, but I mean, it don't stop a cop from killing nobody. You know what I mean? So no. we have to figure out what we can do beyond that. Um, somebody asks, where am I based? So I'm a little bit of a nomad right now. Um, technically, I am local to Atlanta. That is where my permanent address is. That's where Mike Vegan is located out of. I am. A, I have before coronavirus. Um, I was doing a lot more work in television, and so I was in New York for a good period of time. Um, so that is. I'm based in a, in a few places. So um, if you go to my page, you'll see um, which is at it's Kimberly Renee. Um, New York, D.C., Atlanta, and North Carolina are places that I hop between. Um, North Carolina is like home home. That's where I grew up. That's where I'm from. Um, that's where my accent's from. So if you if you're curious about where that country has come from, that's what it is. Um, <laughs> but the uh, New York is where I where I do business. DC is where I do business, and Atlanta is where I do business. Yep, and we're very fortunate right now that you're in the same state as I am. You're in North Carolina. You're like an hour and a half from me <laughs> right now, which is actually pretty cool. Thank you, Dina, for the question. That was actually pretty cool. No, you said before we went live that there are a few things that nobody knows really that you're working well, I, on. I shared it already. You didn't hear it? Well, I was that I'm talking to brands and holding them accountable. That was what that's the thing. And okay. helping walk them through not just right. making public statements, but making internal changes. Like these are this is huge. Like literally, I'm sitting sitting across from the CEO of whatever business, businesses that have made wrong statements, that have made good statements, that have made no statements. Um, yeah, I was gonna I was gonna disclose something, but I'm not because I don't want to like blast nobody because that's not my business. Um, okay, but I've definitely if you when you see brands who have not posted that, then all of a sudden like okay now they say something. Don't be mad. They're trying. Okay, they're working, and I'm probably talking to them. <laughs> So that we can figure out what that means globally and not just let me make just put words out. You know, we're, we're interested in actions, um, not just not just words. Because um, words are beautiful. I have a ton of them. As y'all can see, I can talk a lot. But uh, words are great inspiration. But what needs to come with them is action. And so that's what I try to do. I try to use this inspiration here to encourage people to make good decisions that will lead to equitable, equitable treatment across the board that will lead to, you know, the the breakdown of the school to prison pipeline that will address issues that have resulted from redlining that will help us to um, eradicate food deserts that, you know, all these conversations that are important that have that are in inequities that many of us are experiencing that these are the conversations that I'm having and how we can address these, um, not just from a political standpoint, like I'm not I'm not running for office. I'm not trying to run for office. I'm not talking to, well, I am talking to a couple of political leaders, but that's for a different reason. Um, but I'm not trying to, we're not, this is not a political, this is all grassroots. This is what everybody is doing internally in their business and then in their own selves. So that's what businesses can do. I thought there was more. I thought there was more stuff that you had that you could leak out. I don't know. You might have more, no, but I can't I give too much. I can't <laughs> give too much because okay. it's kind of like when you, you know, it's kind of like therapy. You know what I mean? You go to a therapist and then they tell you all your good, all the goodies and then you're helping them, you know, but you don't want to, I'm not going to put them on blast. I'm not their therapist, but I am, you know, holding closely important information about how jacked up their business is and how they don't have black people that work there and how their board is a bunch of white men. You know what I mean? So I'm having these conversations and everybody's yelling at them like, what you going to do? And I'm like, keep yelling because we're going to talk about it. We're going to fix it. 
All right. So then my question for you is that's how businesses are helping businesses do this. Oh, wait, Evan has a, let's see what Evan has to say instead of a question. But this corporate yes. Role? Yes, Evan. Are they? Yes, more Evan, all of them. Have more Oh, that's awesome. They're talking more having an inclusive message. That's awesome. Yes. The message is step one. Um, I don't even encourage the message. It is let's talk about internal first. Um, and we have like a full just breakdown of oh, you probably want to read the question for Instagram because Instagram I, I was I was I, thinking that so I'm bad. I was in the sorry, Instagram so give me an idea. idea. <laughs> Well, just read. We're going to go back a second. Reverse. So here comes my dog. When in those corporate rooms, are they more talking about having a more inclusive public message and or do they mention anything about their HR department, like internally changing the corporate culture? Sorry for the long question. So that's from Evan. He's at Cotton Branch Sanctuary, by the way, if you didn't know. Yes. So we are having all of those conversations. We're talking about things that you can do now via social media more immediately. And we're talking about what is happening long term um, and what is happening that is sustainable. Because I don't, because I've had a lot of people say, okay, well, we're going to bring in uh, DEI or diversity, equity, inclusion consultants and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, that's great. And most of us have been through one and most of us have forgotten what we learned. You know what I mean? So let's just be honest and say it's a great start, but it doesn't, it's not sustainable. Um, so we have to build systems that allow us to sustain the things that we have learned, hold each other accountable one-to-one. -one. Um, but again, these are all private conversations. I'm not gonna divulge all of that, uh, but it is the work on the people within the organization and the work of what those, the HR department is doing, the work that the suppliers are doing. It's, it's all of that. It's not just make a nice statement and tell everybody that you love black people. That's not like, that's, I don't care about that you know so no i hear it so then my question thank you everyone for yours was okay so you have businesses and what they can do i would love to hear what your advice is for people just everyday Ooh. people like those that are watching like what can they do so i have a dog walking across me <laughs> yeah so so i'm gonna i'm gonna make my answer really simple um I have a link right now on Instagram that says Black Lives Matter resources put together by Splendid Spoon. Their team of white gals <laughs> got together and collectively pulled together a list of these are things that you can do from where you give your money, which is one part of it, to where you can learn, uh, to how you can activate, to how you can help other people, um, to how you can look within yourself and do some internal work. Um, but I will not take on the honest of trying to tell everybody what they need and what they should do. Um, that is a, that is a lot of weight for me to carry. So I am encouraging, what's up, Carrie? I am encouraging people to read through those resources. They were built for white people by white people who are being thoughtful about the Black Lives Matter movement. All right, that's awesome. I, I posted uh, in the comments on Facebook because Instagram, you know what her Instagram is. On Facebook, oh, yes. her Instagram is it's Kimberly Renee. Do you have a presence on Facebook? Yeah, I don't really use it. Like I don't, I don't really like Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I understand. It's good for stuff like this, but I get that Instagram is also uh, you reach a lot of people on Instagram. As yeah, well. and it's much more fast moving, and the capacity to reach people is a lot easier. Um, yeah, and that, and that, oh, geez, there goes the dog. And there's not not a single, not a single person posted anything negative on my Black Lives Matter post on Instagram. Mm. On nine, eight or nine Instagrams, not a single, not a single negative post, not a single all was posted on Instagram. Uh, just on Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Facebook is older, so I think we have to keep that in mind. And um, older generations often, and it's not exclusionary, obviously, and it's not all inclusive, but you're going to experience some, some what I've heard called stinking thinking, that we have to spend time uh, unlearning. 
Right. And that's part of the reason that we're doing this is that yes. for people to, <laughs> if they are watching, they have some of that sneaking thinking that they, you know, dispel it, educate themselves, uh, learn from other people, listen, don't do all the talking. It's uh, some good advice. <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot of information out there. There's some terrible information out there, but there's a lot of really good information out there. If you want to educate yourself on exactly what's going on in the world. And also please don't forget that there's still a deadly virus going on. There's still a deadly virus and we're in North Carolina. It is not getting better here. It is getting worse. And that is pretty scary. And I totally appreciate the protesting and I really appreciate everyone wearing their masks. A lot of people wearing masks while doing it because that'll, that'll help with the spread of this virus because it just didn't go away. It just didn't go away. True story. It is still story. there. Well, that's like really cool. Kimberly, is there anything else that you want to share? Oh, I mean, Helene, you would know. Like, you would know because, I mean, you you experienced the talk that I gave on um, at Atlanta Veg Fest. Um, I know I talked about a little bit of, you know, police anxiety that I had. Um, I talked about the, the story of... Um, working at Guilford College in Greensboro, North Carolina, which is interesting because working at Guilford College, it's a Quaker university, a Quaker institution rather. And if you're not familiar with Quakers, they were instrumental in the facilitation of the Underground Railroad. So it's so interesting to go to an institution like that and experience racism. It's like, ah, how do we get here? <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so, you know, I talked a lot about that. So I don't know which story you want to hear. I don't even know how much time we have for stories. I think we have about 15 more minutes. Yeah. Oh, puppy loves you. <laughs> so sorry. I, they don't normally do this, but yeah, you can. They sense you needed some love. They so, sense that. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> this they is Marshall. Just, they knew. They didn't they're know. So in, they're, they're intuitive. <laughs> yeah. He, he's, he's been on Facebook and uh, normally the front of his head, not the back. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Marshall the brown eyed dog is his hashtag, and uh, he's obviously a big mush. <laughs> so, I, I guess I'll do the talk like this from here forward. <laughs> okay. Okay. So funny, yeah. No, feel yeah. free. Um, any story that you want to share, because one of the Ooh. things that everyone knows when, when I did this, I actually said to the audience i think i said that you know i think you know i i don't know how they weren't squirming in their seats because you were i felt like you were really putting them on the spot to think and to feel and to look at what reality is and i don't know if i, I sadly the atlanta veg fest isn't happening this year because of the virus and i know lee's in here watching thank you lee uh for joining but i think if it was like trying to get him off of me i think if it was this year and you did the same talk, the reception would be completely different. But the, but you got to think about it though, um, Helene. Like at the end of that talk, the, I mean, everybody was standing in line to keep talking. Like they didn't want to leave. Right. You know. So because it wasn't the 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 talk that I did wasn't. Um, I try to share in a way that isn't condemning, right. but is but allows people to search you know, and, and do, do an internal search. Um, cause it's, it's no fun regardless of whether or not you are complicit. It's no fun when somebody's doing this, like, and some people can function that way. I'm not that person. So I try to talk to people who I know would feel like me. Like if you start yelling at me, I'm leaving. Like, I just like, I'm sorry. Like I, I may have did, I may have done it. It's, it's my fault, but like, I just can't, I can't handle it. So, um, so I try to give people what I would want to receive in the way of encouragement um, admonishment and that kind of thing. Um, but let me see if I can come, if I can find one other story from, from that talk without, um, obviously having to give it because it was, it was lengthy. It was, it was emotional. I didn't cry then, but, <laughs> but it was still emotional. Um, let's see what stories. Um, oh, this was interesting. This is a little mini story. Um, so I have a friend who is Russian her name is Allah, um, a really good friend. She's actually the one who uh, manages my 
business mailbox in Atlanta while I'm up here. And she goes there every so often and collects all my mail and sends it to me. So she's like a really good, really good friend. And when I first met her um, and we were kind of getting to know each other, uh, she she called me an angry black woman. <laughs> and I was like, okay, friend, um, let's talk about this. And so I'll share my thoughts, you know, about that, and and hopefully, people can take that and 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 use it. Um, if if somebody had was was beating up on your kid, you would be angry, right? If somebody was beating up on your kid, you would be angry. Um, if somebody what has spent so many years not paying attention to you or not listening to you or not hearing your voice, you might be a little upset. On the flip side, um, just because a person is firm in how they communicate doesn't mean that they're angry. And just because a person is angry doesn't mean that they are fitting into a stereotype because I find myself fighting against that stereotype and trying not to be angry so that nobody calls me angry because I don't wanna be called a statistic, but I have all my feelings. So, because what, what that does is when you call a woman, a black woman, an angry black woman, is you're invalidating her feelings and experiences. Even if, if she's angry or not angry, it's an invalidation of, of her and that bias is hurtful ultimately. Because in those moments where anger is necessary, we sometimes hesitate not to be angry so that we can continue to be polite so that white people can accept us and not reject us. Like in as much as we don't want to say that sometimes we do that, like when you're working in corporate America, a lot of times you're, you're working in a way so that you can keep your job, which means that you wanna be accepted in some way so that you can keep in your paychecks, you can go home and feed your kids. You know, so, I mean, I know that's a difficult thing to, to hold on to, but, it's the reality of being black in a corporate space is that you've, you have a corporation that is built around the values and the understanding and the preferences of white people. So when we go into that space, we have to behave in a way that makes them comfortable. Like, I can't tell you how many times that I've been told, like, don't wear your hair like that because you won't get a job. Like my mother has said that to me when I was a kid, like you need to straighten your hair so, they, so they'll like you more or so that you won't come off as offensive, so they won't be afraid of you. I had someone tell me in a corporate environment, they wrote this down in a review, not from my supervisors or anybody who managed me, from people on the outside who were looking in. They said they were afraid of me. Afraid of me, afraid. My response is, what are you afraid of? Are you afraid that I'm going to stab you? Do you think I have a gun? And if the answer is no, then how do you, what, what's, what's fear? What's that fear? The fear is that I'm smarter than you. The fear is that when you see me, you see a black person and that black person is challenging the idea that unconsciously we've been taught that white is good We've been taught that white is smarter than black. We've been taught that white is better than black. We've, we've been taught that unconsciously. And so when we go in these corporate environments and then you see a black person who conflicts that idea, it becomes scary because you're attacking their, who they believe they are. I'm a white person, I'm supposed to be smarter than black people. What is this? I am afraid, I am afraid that I am no longer the best because they've often built their the value or the, the system of who they are on being better than a black person. It's also why you see when people post about black people, people say, well, what about me? Because it challenges them to recenter their entire world so that it's not just about them and how amazing they are and how amazing their race is or, or their ethnicity or whatever, however you want to define white. Um, in this instance, because white, you know, just, whiteness is one thing, but you know, your you may have different come from different countries and, and places in your family and all that. Um, 
but it's challenging because you're challenging the person of who they are. And when people get challenged with who they are, they fight. And so I was called divisive, destructive. I was called so many names. Oh my God. Like just, and all I wanted to do was do my job, come in, make people happy. I just want to do my job, but doing my job and doing it in a way that I was smart, um, was offensive to people because they, it offended the deep seated belief that they were bet they're supposed to be better than another race of people. And so challenging that idea, especially like I said, at a, an institution that is supposed to be uh, built around inclusivity, like that, that was tough, that was tough. And to not have allies, like even my boss, actually ran into her. Matter of fact, I ran into my old boss at the grocery store when I came here. And it was difficult. It's like, cause I don't have any you know, animosity towards her in that entire experience, but it has sat with me for a long time. It's a story that I would continue to, to tell about how when I needed a white woman to stand up with me, she could not be found because she was the only one, her and her uh, colleague were the only one who could speak to my real character because they saw me and worked with me every day. They had literally written a review about me and said that we love her. Oh, you got shakes out. She said, I would give you all like tens on your review, but if I did that, nobody would believe me. That's what she said. Next day, next, like next week, the next week I get a review that says from, not from her, not from the people I work with, from another department, and they were mad at me because somebody had got corrected from something. Somebody was doing something wrong. And I was like, hey, I think you might want to fix that. I whispered it or whatever. But they were mad because they got corrected by a black woman. So now I have to deal with someone wanting to put me in my place. And that place was, I need you to know that I'm in charge. And you can't say that kind of stuff to me because I'm, I am better than you. Um, and yep, that happened. And then I had to go to, uh, I got sentenced to what they called coaching slash counseling because they told me something was wrong with me. So I sat in these sessions, I get to the session, the first session, and, um, I tell the woman the truth. I said, I am here because I am a black woman and I am smart. And I said something that was offensive to the white man who runs this department. And he is doing this because he wants me to make sure that I am in my place. She didn't believe me until we finished eight weeks of sessions. She told me when I took my test, she says, well, your tests say that you're well adapted and that you are, you know, you're comfortable experiencing change. She sent me through all these tests. And every time I took a test, she said, well, you must have lied on the test. I'm like, how? Oh, how? Like, if, if I can lie on a test and change the results, then the test is biased in and of itself, and you shouldn't have gave me the test in the first place. But I'm not going to say that, because if I correct you as a white woman, then I'm wrong again. But I was like, all right, cool. So I took all my tests. We went through the end. When we got to the end, she was like, you know what? When you first came here and you said that to me, I, I just didn't believe you. You know, I thought that, you know, maybe you just weren't seeing the truth and we could work on it. But, you know, maybe, maybe this places and this isn't somewhere where you uh, should work. It doesn't sound like it's, I said, so, so that's your advice for me? After eight weeks of me feeling like I have all oh, the little puppy coming through the screen. That is so funny. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so after eight weeks of us going through this nonsense, I bet you, are you going to go back and tell them what you just said? No, because here's the thing. The co that coach was also the coach, uh, was also the coach of the person who told me that I was divisive, destructive, and that I was an angry black woman, and that I need to be put in my place. He was, that was her coach too. No, that was, she was uh, his coach too. So I'm like, I can't even really confide in you because y'all, y'all complicit together. So, so I say all of that to say, white women, this is gonna be a real hard statement. This is gonna be real hard. Y'all have disappointed me the most because the difference between white men is white men usually let you know where they stand. 
white women will show up to be your friend. And then when you actually really need them, they don't show up. And I don't mean all of them. Don't at me. I'm tired. Okay, don't at me. What I'm asking you to do is look within yourself and say, how can I step up and be a better ally? Because in that moment, I went through so much drama and trauma trying to get someone to see the truth about me when the, the white woman who, who was my supervisor knew the truth, told me the truth. And then she even questioned me, said, well, maybe it's something to it if somebody else saw it. I said, supervisor, you've been with me the whole time. How is this? She was, so it wasn't until she talked to some of her other white friends who just so happened to be a little woke and they said, girl, this is racist. What are you talking about? Then she come back and say, oh, well, I guess it's true. So I needed a white person to validate me. Like this is the, this is the trauma and the drama and the microaggressions that we deal with on a daily basis where it's like, I'm telling you the truth but you question me because you've never experienced it. It's like, just like, just like Helene said a minute ago, you gotta listen first. I understand asking questions and wanting to understand, but boy, you gotta listen. And white women, please learn how to be better allies. Like I said, many people have put together resources. There's Splendid Spoon put one together in my, and I link to it in my bio but we have to figure out how to be better allies. So my live is about to disappear in about 20 seconds. Um, we're still on Facebook. I don't mind still talking. I'll restart the live if y'all want to keep listening. Um, but yeah, that's going to be up to Helene. So, so yeah, but I'm still here. So hopefully that's helpful for you. Thank you. Uh, seriously, thank you for sharing that because the right, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't quite understand right now why people feel so threatened just because you give other people rights doesn't mean that you lose any yourself, right? I mean, we don't lose something because we say you can have it too. Yeah. No, that's not what happens. I think that's what the fear is that'll happen. It's like if suddenly you get to have like equal yeah. rights, equal stature, equal balance, equal things that, that I don't have those things anymore. Right. And that's not right. true because first of all, the things shouldn't matter as much as human beings. Right. Ever, ever. Right. Things don't matter as much as humans and animals. They don't matter as much. So if you can get that through and understand that and you can have some compassion and understanding, I, I get that so many people have to go through things in order to understand what it's like. I'm not one of those people. I don't need to walk in your shoes necessarily to get that it's shit to walk in your shoes. Yeah. I don't need to catch this virus to get that I don't want to catch this virus. Right. Right. <laughs> I have friends that have been very sick. We did a talk with two of them recently. You can watch it. They were really sick. One of them has been sick for over 11 weeks. Wow. Not a one and done. And she was. she is a healthy gluten-free, plant-based vegan. Yeah. And she's still sick. She just posted today. She did a fantastic, Tammy did a great post today on her personal page that she, she said to me the other day that she didn't feel like she was concise. I said, whoa, her post today just proves that she totally was and is. So yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm not going to get up on a soapbox. I mean, I obviously have this platform. I want to open it up to as many people as possible. Today was also an incredibly important talk for you to share your thoughts, your feelings, what life is like, you know, in your shoes. So other people can understand that. Just wake up. I mean, just wake the fuck up. <laughs> It's, it's 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 so simple it's so simple people please do it i get i yeah so before we started this i said i was at like a loss for words what's going on in the world and i am i'm truly i there's evans on here he and josh are out there on social media uh just trying to wake people up as well 
as I said, they're Cotton Branch, and we, we've had them on here too. I I appreciate you. I I I couldn't imagine at this point in my life, at twenty something years old, do do I think I would have stood up for you? No. At fifty years old, or the last ten years of my life, oh, you bet. I I have to watch my words as opposed to you know limit. I have to limit how much I say as opposed yeah. to not say enough. Yeah. <laughs> I, and, I go the other way. <laughs> yeah, and and in that moment, um, just the she was threatened too. You know, she was told that if she says anything about this, um, then she'll be fired. Right. So in that, that's why one of the reasons why I said I don't blame her i just want to encourage other people to be better allies um and instead of assuming the worst uh assume the best and then learn the details no different than when you see another person that says i'm being victimized you say okay um how can i help and then you learn more. And then if you find out, wait, they're lying? You're like, girl, boy, come on. You, But you wait for that. You don't assume that to start, um, especially when you have firsthand information. And in this instance, she had firsthand information. She literally would have given me um, a full, you know, 10 stars across the board, five stars, whatever the number were, across the board for working together, you know, being communicative, getting the work done, getting results. Um, working in teams, all of that. Like, she was like, I, you know, one of the best people that I've ever worked with. Um, you know, I love you like family. Do you though? Right. Cause here's, the mo here's that moment. Right. And my family did, my family was ready to punch you in the face. Right. <laughs> you know, that's what my family was. Um, so, I mean, that, that's just, that's just being honest about, about where it is. So. So Kimberly, can you tell everyone once again how they can find you, how they can support you? Yeah, for sure. So I am, it's Kimberly Renee on Instagram. I also have Might Be Vegan on Facebook. Not much happens over there, but feel free to go like the page because I'm sure at some point I will have a plan for Facebook. Right now, I do not. Um, you can also connect with me with respect to Food Love. We are uh, always looking for donations. As I said at the beginning of this talk, Food Love is about uh, digging into the depths of society and identifying the people who are at uh, risk the most and are struggling the most with the help of caseworkers and social workers and getting fresh plant-based food to their doorstep. Um, so in that, we have helped uh, cancer patients. We've helped people who have illnesses on top of illnesses on, on top of illnesses. We've helped people living in food deserts. We've helped people who are uh, just recently separated because of um, uh, abusive situations. And now they're they're living on their own, coming out of a house, you know, because coronavirus put everybody together. So it got real bad. So we're helping as many people as we can who are struggling. That also includes um, black and brown people, obviously. Uh, because we're we're more than likely to live in a food desert, and so a lot of Black and Brown people are currently being helped. Um, in addition to how COVID nineteen is disproportionately impacting our health, so I want to get fresh food to them to help build their immune system as well. Um, so that is what I'm doing. So you can go to my website, you can go to uh, mybevegan.co, or you can check it out on Instagram. Um, we have a GoFundMe that is fueling. Um, getting more food to people after our donation level, you know, exceeds for that week. We, we add donations to get more food out. So nobody is, is left waiting. So, um, so yeah, so that is, that's me and what I do. And thank y'all for listening. And everyone, thank you again on Saturday at 4 PM Eastern daylight time. Our next talk is, is with Dr. Tiana L. Jenkins, PhD, MPH. She is from Arkansas and I'm pretty excited. Wait, what is the site again? It is might must be vegan. That's the might, might 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 be vegan. <laughs> what is wrong with me? <laughs> might vegan.co. Might be vegan.co. Let me I can type yes. that. So might be vegan.co is the website that you can go to and you can find all that information. So everyone, thank you for watching. We look forward to doing this again on Saturday. And we've got talks booked through july i think at this point <laughs> so it's it's actually pretty cool and 
Please be safe. Please follow Virtual Veg Fest wherever you can. Subscribe to our YouTube channel so we can build that up. Share this so everyone else can see it with everyone you know so we can help our vendors, you know, get through this uh, virus situation. And please stand up. It's, you know, stand up for what is right and please be on the correct side of history because we feel that we are on the correct side. Thank you, Kimberly. I appreciate you. Absolutely. For sure. Right. Thanks so much. Bye, Bye everyone. Thanks. You're welcome, Evan.